Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. This episode of Tourpreneur is sponsored by Fair Harbor. Fair Harbor fuels the experiences of the travel industry with the most comprehensive online reservation system available for tours, activities, and attractions. Visit fairharbor.com to see why over 15,000 businesses worldwide trust Fair Harbor to better serve their customers and increase online bookings. Welcome to the Tourpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow tourpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 147 of Tourpreneur, the podcast where we flatten the learning curve for tour operators and travel professionals around the world. I hope you're buckled in for today's episode. It is a story of resilience. You will be left inspired by today's guest, Crystal Tonison of Wanaka Water Taxis in New Zealand. Let me share with you very briefly Crystal's story. So her and her partner, Brent, set up the water tour operator business five years ago. Things were really going well. Uh, They bought a second boat. Crystal, who initially was back office, started getting out on the water. But then Brent, her partner's health, seriously deteriorated. He needed a kidney transplant. And when they were going through the tests for that, they discovered he had a heart problem, which is ironic, Crystal tells us, because Brent's one of the fittest guys ever. So he needed open heart surgery. And then when they were testing for that, they discovered there was another infection. And unfortunately, they needed to amputate his leg. So you have all of that going on, and he's waiting for his transplant. And then Crystal's running everything on her own, and COVID comes along. So today, Crystal shares with us her journey through all of this. But it's not a pity party. This is why I'm saying this is a very inspirational episode of Torpreneur. It's a very special one because Crystal basically tells us how she just took the reins herself and is running the business herself. And she even shares three key learnings uh, with us that she has personally learned over the last couple of years when it comes to running a tour operator business. So uh, let me just say, Brent, if you're listening to this, which I, I hope you will be, we all wish you the very best with your recovery And also just want to say how grateful we are to Crystal for coming on to the show. She's a longtime listener of Torpreneur. I'm always very honored and humbled by that. I'm just very grateful that she was prepared to come on and talk us through what's been a very painful couple of years. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Crystal Tonison. How are you, Crystal? I'm very good. How are you? I'm uh, delighted to speak to you. You've got quite the story. And first of all, I want to thank you for coming on to Torpreneur to share what's been happening with your business over the last couple of years. It's pretty unique. And I feel that your experiences over the last few years are going to inspire and motivate many of our listeners. So I'm really excited to dive into the story of Wanaka Water Taxis. Great. Sounds good. First of all, I want to cover some of the things that have happened to you in the last couple of years, and then I want to get into the three major learnings that you want to share with our listeners. So first of all, you were telling me that your business, you set it up with your partner, Brent, five years ago, and you initially were in an admin sales and marketing role. Is that correct when you started the business? 
Yeah, so he started it without me. And after a year, I joined in just doing um, the admin, sales, marketing, stuff like that. Just um, things in the office and behind the scenes. Sure. And then three years ago, you bought a second boat, correct? And you got your license for that one. And then you started actually getting out on the water. So away from QuickBooks and <laughs> paperwork, and you were actually starting leading tours. Exactly. And that's, um, that's more my thing. <laughs> so that was really good. Um, and it was great just to have that balance of, of being out on the lake with guests again and in the office. So just a mixture, which was awesome. Yeah. Sure. So for those of us, myself included, that have never been to New Zealand, tell us a little bit about your tours and the area that you operate in. The name is a bit deceiving because it's a Wanaka water taxi. So you kind of think it's just a water taxi dropping people off uh, on certain different places, which is what we do a bit, but we mostly do is actually tours. So we do tours to an island on the lake. Well, there are a few islands, but uh, we mostly go to the one island Bit of a hidden gem. There are a lot of Kiwis that don't even know about it. It's a nature reserve and it has a glacial lake on top of the island, which also has a big cliff. So you get a view at the top of the lake in the island and then the whole of Lake Wanaka as well. So it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the native birds are all over the island. Um, they were able to introduce a bird that was extinct in mainland New Zealand. Um, and they have reintroduced it to the island. So it's, so that's where we mostly go, but we do self-guide it on the island. So we tell them all about it on the way there, but once they get there, they, um, they, our guests just get to explore it at their own pace. And then we also do boat access four-wheel drive trips, which goes to a private station. Uh, we're the only one who gets get to go there. So that's boating again, and then up with the four-wheel drive uh, with one of our guides. and then. Uh, gorgeous picnic up at the top of the mountain that's what we mostly do we have some other island trips for families and we do some drop-offs for bikers and hikers and stuff like that as well i urge our listeners to go check out your website uh, if you go to tourpreneur.com forward slash 147 you will see the links there and it's just i mean i was looking at it earlier on it's a stunning part of the world that you're in crystal it is gorgeous that makes it easy for us yeah yeah, but the other question I have, and I'm sure my listeners have right now, is that's not a Kiwi accent we can hear, is it? No. Nope. <laughs> no. So my partner is Kiwi, and uh, my guides and my skippers are Kiwi. But um, yeah, I'm Dutch, and I came to New Zealand about 12, 13, 13 years ago. And before that, I lived in Austria. And so I always loved the mountains and lakes. So yeah, I used to work at ski schools, so that's why I came from Austria to New Zealand because it was um, winter here when it was summer in Austria, so I could keep skiing. Of course. I want to dig into a bit more of your story here. So was it around two years ago, unfortunately, your, your partner Brent, his health started to, to deteriorate. What exactly happened? Um, so Brent has a genetic disease, which is very rare. We're only aware of two people having it in New Zealand, um, and that caused him to have a double transplant, uh, which was needed in 95. So he had a liver and kidney transplant. And kidneys always go downhill kind of from the time you get them because um, they don't last forever. So most people last about 10 to 15 years, but his was about 25 years. So that was really good. Um, but the time came for him to get ready to get a new kidney. That's actually one of the reasons I jumped in at first, because he kind of did everything by himself. And I saw that it was um, breaking him up. So that's why I started jumping in with doing sales and marketing and all those things for him. And then because it was coming for such a long time, because you can just you know gradually see the numbers going down. So we kind of planned for it. and. Um, Doctors were also happy to work around their schedule. So we had it planned to get it all sorted over the winter. And that was very wishful thinking <laughs> because, yeah, that didn't happen. Why didn't that happen? So in May, two years ago, Brent was getting all tested up because the first thing they do before they 
test anyone else um, to see if they're a match to donate a kidney. They test up him completely. So they did all these tests to see if his body was healthy enough to handle another kidney transplant. When they did that, they actually found out that he had a heart problem. So he had a leaky valve and an enlarged aorta. Now he's the fittest guy you've ever met. So that was quite a surprise to us. He was on extra medication, still ski touring uh, just a year before that. And while the doctors were telling us he was kayaking. So we're just like, what? <laughs> but at first it was actually one of the nephrologists who told us, and she didn't tell us in a very nice way. She just said, oh, they found a heart problem and looks like you won't be able to get a kidney transplant. So that was basically a, a death sentence. So we were pretty devastated, of course, and then decided just to get out of town and just go on a weekend trip, two days. One stage we looked at each other and we're like, well, that was someone specialized in kidneys. Let's see what the heart specialist says first. So kind of dropped that thought again and just kind of did like, okay, we'll deal with it when it comes. So we waited to see the heart specialist and he was in very... Uh, very positive either but the surgeon luckily was so um, the surgeon did decide he was gonna do the surgery um, they just wanted to wait till he was really bad enough to need dialysis so that's what we did so that was in October 2019 so that's when he had to go to the hospital to be there every day and the hospital in New Zealand they're not very close <laughs> so the nearest one is three and a half hours drive and the one that he is being treated is a six-hour drive. And so he had to move away uh, once the season was starting again. And uh, it was going to be for a year, we thought. <laughs> and again, we were, that was wishful thinking. <laughs> uh, so that's when I started uh, taking over the business and doing it all by myself. So that was the first season. That was the 2019-2020 season. Sure. And we're going to get into some of those those lessons shortly. But I, I wanted to continue with the story here because Brent goes off for, for open heart surgery or that was planned, but then you had the eruption, correct? Yes. So it was planned for middle of December. And then the eruption was at White Island and the Christchurch Hospital is not near White Island, but they put their hands up to take most of the victims. So the ICU was full and that delayed Brent's surgery by two months. And so then it wasn't until mid-February where he finally had the open heart surgery. Once that went through and it went really well, it was all good to go. Um, we talked to his nephrologist uh, the day after and asked, can we start the procedure again of getting Brent's sister tested? Because they won't do anything unless Brent is ready to go. So they said, yep. She's all good to go. So she uh, contacted the team and her appointments got planned in and then COVID happened and they weren't allowed to do anything but pretty much life-threatening um, cases in the hospital. So they weren't allowed to test her at all. So that got delayed by a very long time. We didn't know that she was a match until September. And that was, of course, great news. She was a match. They planned in the transplant for November. But Brent's underlying condition is that he has a lot of calcium in his body because that was his liver wasn't breaking that down way back. So the first 20 years of his life, he had quite a lot of calcium in his body. And because his kidney now hasn't been functioning for so long, and he was on dialysis this whole time, uh, some of the capillaries in his toes started getting blocked. So that started getting worse and worse and worse. And unfortunately, a week before the transplant was supposed to be, he um, lost his leg just below the knee. So that was a big blow. And then, of course, the transplant didn't go ahead. Actually, I mean, it was a horrible he lost his leg, but he, he almost lost his life there because his toes had no blood flow um, and that got infected. And the infection actually went through his whole body and went to his heart. 
Now, if that would have gone onto his new heart valve, they would have had to do the open heart surgery all over again, which they probably wouldn't have done. But luckily, it went to his healthy heart valve, and they managed to get rid of that with two months of antibiotics. And then they had to wait for the wound on the leg to heal. And then finally, two weeks ago, he had a successful kidney transplant. So we're finally there. How is he feeling now? He's pretty, feeling pretty good since two days ago. He's starting to feel the benefits of having a new kidney. He's been pretty sore still. And he's getting his prosthetic next week. So he's, yeah, he's definitely feeling much better now. Definitely start to think about work again and coming up with new products and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. I mean, my heart goes out to you on a personal level, just to go through that with a member of your family, with in your case, your partner is, is absolutely horrific, all those ups and downs. But then that is compounded by going through the COVID crisis and you having a business in tour and travel. Yeah, I mean, I must say, in the first season that I ran the business by myself, we had, you know, a couple of those medical blows and like the delays of the surgeries. And we had, we started the season with really bad weather and a lot of rain, which then turned into a flood. So there was so much already happening that by the time COVID came, I was like, oh yeah, of course I could deal with another, with another challenge. No problem. <laughs> Cause I was just so resilient by then that once COVID came, I was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> you make it sound very easy. And I know it must have been very challenging for you because, yes, you, you'd been skippering some boats, but now you're having to run everything on your own. I'm hearing this a lot right now that the skippers had all left tourism. So you were trying to recruit skippers, but they're not around. And I was talking to a couple of tour operators just this week, actually in Europe, and they're like, I can't get the guides because they've all taken other jobs because it's regular money. They must prefer being a tour guide on the rivers, but they can't give up a good job. Absolutely. Yeah. And fair enough. <laughs> I totally get them. Um, but yeah, that was definitely uh, hard this season. But in the end, I did find someone and she has been incredible. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Like she was happy to work when there was work and happy if there wasn't any work. So that made a huge difference to us this season um, because I wouldn't have been able to hire someone and pay them every day, which made it a lot easier last year because I did, we were still quite young. So it was a bit soon to hire full-time staff, but at least we made the commitment. We were paying them anyway. So if I needed anything done, I was paying them anyway. So they might as well do all those things that needed to be done. But now every time I'm like, Oh, well, am I going to make, um, am I going to invest in letting her do it? Or is it better if I just do it myself and save the money? So I ended up doing a lot more myself, which made it a pretty tiring season, that for sure. But yeah, it was the best thing that happened to us to have her. Um, she was amazing. What's her name? Give her a shout out. Shiloh. Yeah, Shiloh is local girl best skipper i've ever had she's awesome great benther <laughs> so um yeah no she's great so i wanted to share your three big learnings because you've been through a lot i mean crystal you should be writing a book based on what you've gone through because i know that <laughs> i think brent should write a book <laughs> well maybe you should both do it because i don't think we can do this justice in a 45 minute podcast interview to be honest because i know that there, there is a lot that you went through and I, and I will say, right, you know, it's a lot of work to write a book and you're never going to make millions out of writing a book either. So it's very easy for me to say that. But, you know, I do think it's something that operators would value in terms of reading. But I want to get on to your three major learnings. So the first one was focusing on locals and domestic right from the start. So how did you go about doing that? How did you go about marketing to locals and domestic? Well, that's because the first year... Brent did that himself. At that stage, just really focusing on people that were already in Wanaka. So I'll just go in you know, with all the accommodations and have your brochure everywhere and go and see them all the time in the local tourism information center. I think for us, it was having that price set for Kiwi families. So Brent 
is from a family with you know three kids never had too much money so it was always um, quite an investment to do trips when they were traveling in their own country so he always had a, a soft spot for kiwi families <laughs> so he set a price just for new zealand families is that correct yeah yeah and that's you know the same price for everyone else of course for international and kiwis but he just when he set the price he just put kiwi families in mind first and say well can they afford to do this and of course can we afford to run it for this price and then what i've been doing since i mean i find facebook ads actually really working really well and we just do a lot of like local community things so if if they need something for fundraisers or yeah, things like that. We just always give some some prices away and really showing yourself in the community, especially. I just want to go back to Facebook ads. How did you go about learning that? I've learned pretty much everything just myself. That's also how I found your podcast because I've just been uh, listening to that a lot and get inspiration and get tips. And the New Zealand government has been giving everyone a bit of funding this year through COVID for online study, for um, digital marketing, just to be a bit better at that. That Once the borders open again, we're, we're good at marketing our own business. But even before that, I've just tried to learn as much as I could myself. You can learn anything online these days. Where did you go to learn Facebook ads in particular? Did you buy a course or were there any YouTube channels? Were you following anyone? Entrepreneur, of course, and get tips out of your Facebook group. I did do a course two years ago, and that was here in New Zealand with Marijke from Smart Tourism. And that was a course for exactly what we do. So in New Zealand for tourism operators, and it was pretty broad. You learn just about everything. Um, and we covered Facebook ads there a little bit as well. Okay, I just asked because that's one of the top questions I get here at Torpreneur is, hey, I need to learn. I can't afford an agency. I need to do Facebook ads to get local business. How do I go about it? I look at Facebook ad managers and I, and I want to cry because it looks complex. <laughs> and I've really struggled. I've looked around and I've kind of even subscribed to some Facebook ad courses just to see, because you know, I really want to recommend one for operators. And there's a lot of crap out there. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, or stuff that's good, but just not relevant to our industry. If I want to sell herbs and spices or something or shoes online or t-shirts, there's a lot of courses for that. But for selling tours, there doesn't seem to be anything that's specifically aimed at our industry. Yeah, yeah. I started at first doing it from my personal account. I found that way it was much more basic and easier. So I worked through that and learned how to do it in there and then switched over to the Facebook business ad manager. And yeah, then looked a bit more complicated. Yeah. Through the funding, I did have someone to show it to me. And what's been your like number one learning about Facebook ads since you've started that you'd share with another tour operator? Just really know what market you want to target. Don't just throw it out to everyone. Have a look at which market, where are people coming from? Like I've been this whole season been asking everyone like where which town in which city in New Zealand they're from to so have an idea what kind of people are coming from and then just really targeting those areas people like that market then just throw it out to the whole country and then hope for the best and how or where are most of your customers coming from how are they finding out about you well we have a lot of guests that have been on a trip to tell their friends which is great um those are my favorite of course <laughs> But yeah, Facebook ads, um, we're on the New Zealand tourism website. We're on the Wanaka tourism website. Um, we've got brochures everywhere. We did have <laughs> our competitors that do guided trips to the island. They put um, some articles in the newspapers, the big newspapers, and in the Air New Zealand magazine. I must say I've gotten quite a few people off that, so that was really good too. <laughs> got a quick message from one of our sponsors, and then we'll get right back to today's show stay tuned your search for the industry's best online reservation system is over fair harbor enables thousands of tour and activity businesses across the globe with streamlined experiences that convert website visitors into paying customers to strategically increase online bookings and overall revenue 
Their highly customizable cloud-based booking solutions are designed to be easy for you and your customers. Fair Harbor eases every aspect of your day-to-day -day operations through one easy-to-use dashboard. Options like custom seat maps and online seat selection can all be tailored to your unique needs, while capacity limits and contactless mobile ticket scanning help you maintain the latest safety protocols. All of this alongside Fair Harbor's best-in-class 24-7 support. Visit fairharbor.com to see why over 15,000 tour, activity, and attraction businesses choose Fair Harbor. Do you work with OTAs? I do, but now we haven't got many actually this year. Kiwis know that booking direct is better um, and that all the money goes to the operator. They're pretty aware of that. But if the, because our borders are closed, but if I have international guests, I do get. Once Get Your Guide came in, uh, I must say that Viata has dropped a lot and Get Your Guide went up quite a lot so that kind of seems to be a shift there and we do of course work also with travel agents all over the world but yeah we can't get those bookings at the moment you had to learn all of that yes because <laughs> what brent was doing that first right or were you doing that yes he wasn't in the first year not focusing so much on getting people to know about us before they come to new zealand he was just really focusing on people that were already in the country that first year and then we started building from there so we just had a lot of kiwis and people that were just traveling here and looking like oh what can we do the wanaka information center is great they send us quite a lot of business as well what advice do you have for tour operators listening in that have never worked with travel agencies before i at the start just tried to find all these places all the travel agents and just emailed them and sent them through information and stuff but I didn't really know much about rates and all things like that yet. So I never got a reply. <laughs> Once I did the course with Mareike, who was teaching us all about all those things as well, like how to work with the trade. And she also has another business, which is that she does the international market, like the trade. So all the inbound tour operators and the wholesalers for a group of operators. So I think she has about, 20 max so she goes for example to australia and visits all the wholesalers and all the agents there and just represents six of us something like that and she just has all that knowledge she's been in the industry for 25 years so they know her she has a foot in the door she knows exactly how to represent your business and she's also taught me how to do rate sheets and information packages and stuff like that so that really got us going with the trade because suddenly people did reply and they did want to work with us. So that was a, a big game changer to work with um, agents elsewhere. Yeah, I just ask that because it's not a world I'm very familiar with. I've always been on the OTA side. So I was thinking about this the other day that we should probably cover this on the show because we just assume, and that's often the case with being a tourpreneur, it's assumed you know how to work on wholesale rates and how to work with travel agencies and resellers and receptives, but nobody hands you a manual of instructions in this, right? We have to learn on our own. And it sounds like maybe Marika would be a good guest for Torpreneur. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, she would be. With, with uh, 25 years of knowledge, I'm sure she could uh, give some nuggets to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. The second learning you wanted to share with our listeners was the importance of having products in different price ranges. How did you go about setting that up? Uh, well, so we started in the in the budget range with the Moahu trips and, and our most of our water taxi drop-offs are, are pretty good budget range. But then once we going there, we just wanted to have a product that's a bit more for the higher end guests. And that's also something that the trade, like the wholesalers and the agents, they read to sell those products as well. So that's where we came up with the full drive trip. You just cover a bit more of a market. And I must say, we have people that do both trips, but it's just a different market that chooses a trip that's $255 than one that's $125. So you can tap into two markets and not just the one. And now with the, the board is closed, the forward drive isn't doing much. 
because Kiwis are not really the ones who like to do guided trips and um, spend that amount of money that much, but they love the budget trips. So we've been selling the Moahu trips quite well to the Kiwis. So it's, it's just good to have these different price ranges and can get these yeah, different markets. What advice do you have for tourpreneurs when it comes to pricing other than having those segments? Because that's, again, another question I get. It's like, I've got this great idea for a tour, but I don't really know how to price it. I find pricing a hard thing, and it's something I can definitely still learn more. Brenda always does that, and then a lot of times I have to go, well, maybe you should go up a little bit because (laughs) (laughs) we're not making much on that. (laughs) Yes. Well, that's so important, right? Because we need to to make money. As much as we love what we do, we need to be able to put food on the table and buy clothes and roof over our head and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're definitely, like, I think with the premium products, you can add a bit more. And we have, for example, a the forward drive trip, they can add a helicopter flight. So that's a premium product, but the helicopter company wouldn't. Oh wait, you don't pilot the helicopter then? No, no. I thought with you learning everything, you 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 decided to fly <laughs> helicopters as well, Crystal. No, no, no. We just uh, we just hire the helicopter company for that. They didn't want to pay twenty percent commission on that for agents, and the agents were like, just throw it on top, and people want to pay it anyway, and. Yeah, we just started doing that and and yeah, people are still booking it. So I think with the premium ones, you can go up a bit, but with the budget ones, we're actually really on the low margin side and just really going for getting a few more people on our trip instead of less. But yeah, I found, yeah, I found pricing hard. Everyone thinks they're entitled, especially Kiwis and we Dutch are the same, I think they're all entitled title to a discount and it's like well we're already giving a great product with low margins we're doing the best we can for you and now you want a discount as well <laughs> pricing is hard it is and it's a topic that i do want to cover more on future episodes of tourpreneur because there's a lot of science that goes into it as well and and you know i know a lot of our operators kind of you know stick a finger in the air and say we'll charge x amount or What's the competition charging? Let's charge the same and then work out a margin off the back of that, which is not always the right way of going about things. The helicopter combo, when somebody books that, are they paying you a commission on that? Or are you just buying it at a discount and then adding it into How does that all work for you? It's for the full price, but we get 10% of that. But I need to give that to the agent. And then I had to add another 10% to be able to pay 20% to the agent. But if people book direct, then I do get, they do get it. So if I just, just to understand that, if if I land on your website and I'm coming to New Zealand and I want to book the helicopter and the boat, you price that up and then you get a commission from the helicopter company. Is that correct? Yes. And do you have any tips for other operators out there who are just running their own tours right now and they want a partner, let's say with a helicopter company, for instance, or a balloon company, or it may be, what tips do you have for tour operators to go and start those relationships? Just go and see them and see if you can have a meeting with them and let them know what you, what you would like to do and ask what they think. If you're working together with another company, I always think you need to have a good feeling about it. And also make sure that they are able to give you the pricing for the next two years, because that's what you have to do with the trade. They want prices two years ahead. If you set up a price now and then you give it to the trade and then next year the the other company comes back and we're like, oh, we changed our prices. Now you need to pay us this much. Then you've locked them in um, with the trade and then you have a problem there. So just make sure you do get the prices and have that sort it with them because we did have in the first after the first year they did that to us and um, I managed to go back to them and said well you gave us the price for two years so I can't pay you that price that you now want so they're like oh yeah of course so just make sure you have that all in place see that's gold because that's the kind of thing I wouldn't think about I would say okay for the next year This is the price. So for those listening to the show today, just that one tip could be a lifesaver. (laughs) Yeah. 
which is why we produce this podcast, right? Because you've had to learn that the hard way. And luckily you were able to get out of it, but they could have been hard nosed to you and said, no, this is the agreement you've signed. You, you owe us X amount. And yeah, it was a, you know, the price went up by a hundred dollars per person. So I was like, Ooh, that's a hard one to swallow if I have to pay for that. Well, especially with helicopters, because fuel is involved, and you know fuel from the boats as well, right? I mean, that's totally out of your control, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that's hard when you set prices two years ahead. You don't know what the fuel price is going to be in two years. Your third learning was to do as much as possible yourself, learn, learn, and learn. So you have uh, done a tremendous amount of this because of the personal circumstances there. So skippering, how did you learn how to skipper? And then how did you learn how to train another skipper? I've already boated a lot in Austria. I grew up, my parents had boats, so I always boated and then um, did my the recreational license in the Netherlands and then was trained up in Austria to be a skipper for a water ski boat. So I've done quite a lot already. And then once we got this in-house training for boats under six meters, which is what Maritime New Zealand has here in New Zealand. So you can train up your own staff on a six or smaller uh, meter boat, but you need to get all qualifications as a business to do so. But um, Brent got that. So he trained me up to do everything here on the Maritime New Zealand rules. I did that. I didn't actually train Shiloh up. Shiloh is, went to maritime school and she got all her big boat license and everything already. Um, and my skipper from last year came in, started the season to train up the skippers that were helping me out this year. So that was great. What else are you particularly proud of that you taught yourself or that you learned? I think just that people now know about our business, like we're, kind of can't get around us anymore <laughs> in the beginning it was really hard to get out here like there are a bunch of operators that have been here for um, an almost 15 years and they got all the support from the regional um, tourism office and it was really hard to get in there as a small new operator and get them to promote you as well and it just been chipping away at it just doing it all myself without their support and that really paid off this season because all those other operators that have been doing it for a long time, they didn't have to do much marketing because they had the trade booking them anyway. They had the like one for tourism, just doing all advertisement for them. And then now suddenly they had to do it all themselves. They had to focus on locals, which they'd never done before. And they had to do all their marketing themselves because booking weren't just coming in. And there I was ahead of everyone else and going, oh, wow, this is great. I'm finally quite a few steps ahead of the others. And that felt pretty good. What advice would you have for either operators who are just starting out or what I call a torpreneur in waiting where they want to lead a tour, but they're, they're like, oh, all these other operators are super established here. I'm coming in, you know, I'm just a minnow. I'm a small fish. I'm really worried about trying to get some kind of market share. You've done this yourself now. What advice would you have for our listeners who, who are in that, dare I say, boat? As I said with one of the learnings, just learn as much as you can and keep at it. Just keep doing it and doing it. You will get there, actually. <laughs> if you just learn so much yourself, then if you get into situations like this when the borders are suddenly closed, you already step ahead of everyone else. Like what were you, you know, back in the early days, because it's very easy to reflection to go, oh, yeah, you know, we did this for a few years and now we're getting all this business. But in the early years, you must have had moments where you're like, are we wasting our time here? Well, it's David V. Goliath and I don't have a sling. What did you tell yourself during those moments? How did you keep going? You know, when you're just starting, find something that isn't quite done yet. So that's what we had. There was no one else going to the island that did the budget price with the self-guiding, everything was guided and was twice the price. So it definitely had a niche there, which if you have something like that, that's great. Every time you go out there, and that's actually how I looked at doing this season as well. I looked at being right back at the start again and just going, okay, we're, we've got small profit margins, but every time we go out there, 
we can take pictures for our social media, we can get the people to give us a review. Every time we go out there, someone else has gone and they can tell their friends. And every single time you go, your business will grow. Um, so you just take people out and have a great time and just keep going. <laughs> your competitors never saw what you were doing with the budget option and then copy you and offer the same thing? They didn't until this year. This year, some, yeah, one started doing it, dropped his price right down. And another one who actually does completely different trips on the lake actually started completely copying us, including our um, marketing suddenly looked exactly the same. So that was a bit of a blow. How did it make you feel? Oh, that was a big hit because we thought we were friends. It's one way going, guys. This is, we're all struggling here. And, you know, while you're in the hospital and kind of thing, but they just did it and then lied to us. And it was a bit of a, a difficult one. But I just decided to come back earlier and start the season earlier to kind of nip that in the butt. And as soon as I started operating again, all the bookings came to us because people already knew the water taxis, the boat you take if you want the budget trip going out there. Another question for you around learning. So again, like anything in life, you know, learning something takes time. It takes discipline. How did you go about organizing that? Did you schedule your day and say, right, you know, between 10 and 12, I'm learning Facebook ads or one till two, I'm learning Instagram ads. Like, how did you do it? How did you organize it? Um, well, there I'm actually the opposite of um, what they, in any course you do or any podcast or whatever with tips about business um they tell you to schedule all these things and schedule your your social media and schedule this i schedule nothing <laughs> because i'll be in the office and then the phone goes and then i'll be in the office and then i need to go and do a trip so i'm just in and out there is no schedule to my work <laughs> So what I do, do, because I do sometimes, I've been running around doing trips and then I know I have a lot to do and I get into the office and I kind of go blank onto like, what do I have to do? So I do need to write everything down that needs to be done. And if there's certain things I want to work on to learn, I also need to write those down. So then once I do have time in the office, I just look at my list and then just pick the things that need to get done first and then I spend some time on learning stuff but then the phone can go and I have to run out again so Mareike always says operators are very good at putting fires down but you just need to be a bit more proactive but I'm really good at put, putting fires down <laughs> but it's hard I mean it's hard to schedule learning what I find for tourpreneurs which is why I admire you all is there's a million things you can do every day suddenly there's TikTok, and then there's something else and then there's instagram reels and then there's you got to go and meet your local you know cvb a tourism board i mean there's a million things you can do and i think the key is to like you've done you've written down okay what needs to get done what do i need to learn okay this needs to get done before anything else and okay what do i want to learn and then prioritizing because it is so easy to get distracted by shiny objects yeah, I get distracted easily, for sure. <laughs> we all do, because, that you know, social media flashes these things that, oh, you know, there's this course or this webinar or this event or this new TikTok tool or here's a Canva tutorial. <laughs> I mean, I see them all the time. A question I had for you as well is I noticed that you, for your online bookings, you had chosen to work with ResD. What was the thinking behind working with ResD? Um, it was recommended by another operator here actually we just had a booking system that was i think new zealand based and wasn't working at all yeah i got recommended and so i just joined i didn't actually shop at all i was like oh yeah i'll have a look at that and um yeah i've always been really happy with resd you know you get the phone calls fair harbor and all those places and i hear hear a lot of good things about that but I know ResD, so I'm not really looking into changing and do something else. And what is important for me is that I, I don't want to pass on booking costs to our customers. 
So if I then pay for that myself, if I sell the helicopter combo, that's and you pay, you know, was it two percent or something like that? That's actually quite a lot if you sell a couple of those. So I've always said to Resi, like, no, I just want to pay per month. And even though it looks like they don't have that option, you ask for it, you get it. There we go. Got that live from Torpreneur. <laughs> what are you dealing with, Resdi? We have a lot of Resdi staff that, that listen to the show. Is there anything that you would wish they would change or they would add that would make life easier for you? A bit quicker if you have a question. At the start, I would ask a question and you'll get an answer instantly. And that has gotten quite a bit slower. So that's, I think, the main Thing. Has that just been in the last year, Crystal, or? Last two years, I think. Yeah, before that, it was much quicker. Do you use the, I don't know much about it, but do you use the Resdi Marketplace? Do you get much business through that? It's mostly agents kind of requesting your rates. You get that quite a lot. And then not, they don't really get much bookings through that. Way more if you just go directly not like around RESD and then later link in with RESD. But yeah, I mean, with the OTAs and stuff, they're all linked into RESD. So that's great. Um, that's just perfect because there's nothing worse than bookings coming in from all different sides and then you only have 15 spaces and then they all come in from different sides and it doesn't get updated on your own system. You have to do it all by hand while you're getting the boat ready. So that doesn't really work. So um, now I'm pretty be happy with Resty. Great. Are there any tools or apps that are indispensable to you in terms of running your business? <laughs> the weather forecast. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, but can't you just look at the clouds in the sky and know because you know you're you're a seafarer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're um in New Zealand, you're always close to the sea and we have mountains. So <laughs> It's very changeable. But yeah, I use Canva quite a lot. But I don't really use a lot of apps and stuff, actually. How about any books or podcasts that have been very useful or inspirational or motivational for you? Well, of, of course, yours. And there's been a lot of ones that were like really helpful where I can get specific tips out and other maybe is like a different market and is doesn't have specific tools for me but they've been really motivating so every time I was kind of tired and didn't know what to do next just listen to one of your podcasts and just get inspired by other operators and then after you listen you just go oh yeah I really want to get stuff done again and an important one for me this year was actually your podcast with Megan who was just starting up um, and that was because we really decided this season just to look at it as going, I mean, it was our fifth season, but the borders are closed. So we really looked at, are we going to hibernate for a year or shall we open? And we decided to open. And I looked at it going, okay, just going back to the first year, it's about small profit margins, but we're out there. It's about visibility. Uh, we'll get reviews, photos, and people will talk about our trips. And that was just how I really looked at starting this season. But then I listened to her podcast and she was so excited about her first booking. And even if it's just one or two people, like every booking that came in, she was so excited. And that was the part, the missing part of going back to your first season that I was missing. I was like, oh yeah, it's not just those things I just said, but it's also being so excited about every booking that came in so that was a real good lesson for me so i was like oh yeah i need to have that as well and that's a really something i would want to give to everyone else i know a lot of people are still at that stage that we were a year ago they are going to just operate again for the first time hopefully this year just look at it that way and maybe just go back and listen to megan's story and just see how excited she was and that's take that in. I thank you for saying that. I never take those compliments lightly. I get so many emails from listeners who are like, during COVID, listen to your show. It was good to have you in my corner. I felt lonely. I felt isolated. My friends don't understand the challenges of the tour industry, neither do my family, etc. So 
you know, that always makes the work very worthwhile that I do here. And in terms of Morgan, we probably need to do a follow-up episode with her because she actually recently got a full-time job in another part of Georgia with a museum. So she's working full-time there. Um, so I want to talk to Morgan about that decision because I know it was probably a tough one for her to make, but one that we totally understand. And we do have some other tour operators that are just starting up as well that we're going to start that series with shortly. As soon as they start, you know, the problem we've had is that the local conditions have meant you can't take any bookings. So I wanted to wait until the startup operators were actually taking bookings and could get out and lead tours. So hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll have more of the startup series because that was very important like i said earlier on we kind of assume that everyone assumes you know how to deal with wholesalers when no one gives you an instruction book or a manual right with stuff that and sometimes it's embarrassing to ask oh you know how how does this work because a we don't want to look stupid and b we don't want to get ripped off either now i always refuse to go any higher than 20 percent <laughs> commission and it's been working so but no one tells you that yeah absolutely Crystal, your story is phenomenal. I mean, I just can't believe what you've been through and how positive you still sound. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the whole two years, it's been crazy challenging, um, but I love the challenge as well, actually. And just seeing how it did work out. Um, last year was a record season and this year, it's of course very different, but we had a few record days and looking at it at the end of the season, I'm very happy we did decide to uh, open and not hibernate. The amazing support from the locals. and um, But I am very looking forward to the end of the season, which is in three weeks. <laughs> so I'm exhausted. I can imagine. Well, thank you for coming on to Torpreneur and, and sharing a story with us. As I said at the start, uh, I think a lot of our listeners will be inspired by you thinking, wow, if Crystal can get through all of that, then there's no reason why I can't get through this as well and leading my tour business. So thank you very much for coming on to the show. Where can people find your tours online? It's on wanakawatertaxi.co.nz. And we're, of course, also on Instagram and on Facebook. Well, I'd love to invite you back on the show. Once you've recovered, right, when the season ends and you've had a few weeks off and we'd love to invite you back on and maybe we could get a few more Kiwis and Aussies on and talk a little bit more about social media strategies. Because I, I know this is, again, a question I get a great deal is like, how on earth do I use Instagram for my tours? I'm, I'm not sure how to use it, et cetera. It'd be great. You know, I love roundtable discussions where we all talk about what we've actually tried and what's worked and what's failed. Sounds great. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on to the show. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.